together life. The sharp inhalation of breath, energy, air, soil, growth. Green leaves stretching towards the sun, rough wind whistling across jagged rocks. The dance of water, drip of freshly melted ice, the urgency of the hunt, the drive to thrive, survive, and grow. The wake left behind by the movement of magnificent creatures. The flash of speed, spark of life, erosion, exploration, innovation, expansion, growth. This, this is all life interconnected. Every creature's survival, our planet's very future made manifest through these dynamic connections. An interwoven complex web that surrounds and includes every creature, be it human, animal, environmental, each lockstep in a dance that has persisted through all time, nothing existing alone. The strengths of one enriching another, all suffering when one falls. This universal global dance of cause and effect and cause and effect, interconnected lives, health and being tied together, tightly woven into an intricate, delicate balance. Together, linked, whole, all one. One planet, one existence, one health, one future. Ours is a planet shared by many a singular home to a richly diverse spectrum of life forms, all living in a solitary world where the impacts to one are shared by many. This interconnection between people, animals, and their shared environments is a foundation of what is known as One Health. One Health is a collaborative view of the world, interconnected, dependent, linked together. One Health is the way the world works. The blending of animal studies, human studies, and our ecosystem studies. You do not look as this is an environmental issue only, this is an animal health issue only, this is a human health issue only, but really look at how are these things connected. Nothing exists in a vacuum. All of these things have impacts on everything else, and you really need to look at the system as a whole. To understand a One Health view of the world, one has to understand the connection between all living things. Humans connected to animals, which are connected to the environment, which in return is connected back to the humans. Take the thawing sea ice in the Arctic, for example. Snow and ice, important climate regulators, becomes drastically reduced, creating violent weather and severe storms. Some species, such as a bowhead whale, gain weight in the warm water. They have more calves, but their gains might be short-lived. Their food source, zooplankton, disappear because it feeds off an algae reliant on sea ice. The edge of the sea ice becomes unstable, dangerous for human hunters who lose access to their traditional food source as seal and walrus relying on the ice as a platform disperse. Open water creates access for new shipping traffic, impacting marine mammals with vessel traffic, noise, and waste, also increasing the potential for ecosystem-wide impacting accidents and spills. As the soil thaws, the microbiology changes, affecting plants and berries. Animals, parasites, and insects, such as ticks, not typical to the Arctic, move northward. Beaches, typically protected by the ice for much of the year, erodes as the coastline is eaten away meters at a time, destroying communities and homes. In short, lose the sea ice, and every species, every facet of life in the Arctic is impacted significantly because they're all connected. Recognizing the interdependence of human, animal, and environmental health gives researchers the ability to view issues facing our planet through a wide lens, integrate multiple disciplines, and address root causes for problems by understanding the actual source of an issue. In the scientific world and the medical world, we tend to work in silos. We tend to work within our own disease disciplines or areas of uh, interest, and sometimes we don't know what we don't know. By using a One Health approach, we bring other people into the conversation that have other kinds of knowledge that can contribute to our understanding. The tenets of One Health originated in the veterinary profession. We began to realize that about 75% of the emerging infectious diseases in people 
were of zoonotic origin, which means that they came from animals. And so that's where the term One Health came from. And a lot of the, especially infectious disease threats, are intimately related to changes in the land or the animals around people. You actually have to prevent the disease in animals uh, to prevent the disease in people. So you vaccinate dogs against rabies in order to protect people. In recent years, recognizing the global interdependence between humans, animals, and the environment has become vital in the effort to combat disease and prevent outbreaks. In 2020, the highly contagious COVID-19 virus spread throughout the planet, impacting travel, commerce, and the lives of billions of people. As a member of the coronavirus family, COVID-19 attacked the respiratory system, causing sudden viral pneumonia, severe illness, and for some, death. Modern worldwide travel contributed to COVID-19's rapid global proliferation what appears to have begun in China was soon introduced to other nations and within weeks, infection spread to every corner of the globe. Within just a few short months, the virus infected millions of people, killing hundreds of thousands around the world, overwhelming healthcare systems, locking entire nations down to reduce the spread, disrupting global economies to the cost of trillions of dollars in relief efforts. While the sudden spread of the virus caught the world by surprise, researchers had long been warning about a possible global coronavirus pandemic. The SARS virus, which spread throughout Asia in 2003, along with the MERS virus, which impacted the Middle East in 2012, were all members of the same deadly family of viruses. These early coronavirus outbreaks signaled a warning that a future emergence of a SARS-like virus could and would happen, exposing a world that was vulnerably out of balance with humans and animals coexisting in concentrated and potentially dangerous ways. So to really understand human health issues in the infectious disease side, you do need a good understanding of animal dynamics and animal health because they're so closely connected. There isn't one thing that's going on that's wrong. It's usually a multitude of factors. It's important to include all trophic levels and how how are people impacting this organism? Or is the environment healthy? And is that in turn infecting the health of this organism? That's been a longstanding approach at CDC to look at underlying determinants that lead to infectious disease risks and to think about the animal and environmental world as ways to better understand those threats and to reduce the risk. While the exact instance of the viral transfer of COVID-19 to humans may not be known, many infectious disease experts point to the wet markets of China as one place where the disease spread rapidly and then disseminated to other regions. In those markets, hundreds of species of animals are sold in a single marketplace as traditional food sources, increasing the likelihood of disease transmission, not developing effective monitoring and comprehensive safety plans for the wet markets after the SARS and MERS outbreaks was a missed opportunity that might have reduced the spread of the deadly COVID-19 virus. Since the virus likely originated in bats and was transmitted to an intermediate host animal before infecting humans. If we know something about the, the way a, a new disease in animals, the way it progresses from animal to animal, then those are things and how to protect the public from the infection. For many nations, the response to the outbreak was often aligned along partisan and political lines. Effort to contain the outbreak was hampered by disagreements, inaccurate data, and competing worldviews. Additionally, the virus's varied symptoms and incubation period, combined with the lack of available and accurate testing, contributed to its rapid spread. Containment efforts were too little, too late and the infection spread globally, impacting the lives of nearly every person on the planet. The more disciplines we have involved in this, the better background information we're gonna have and the better informed we're gonna be and the better able to address these problems. That comes from building relationships. You don't just get trust, you earn it. One Health at its essence is about communication. We use the One Health method to coordinate, to collaborate, and to communicate uh, infectious disease threats. What we're trying to do is actually operationalize One Health on a very large scale. A lot of the strength of the health system actually lies in identifying prevention approaches and helping communities engage with those. While the elimination of China's wet markets may seem to be the best course of action, when viewed through a One Health worldview, it becomes clear that indigenous people of the region could lose access to their cultural and traditional food sources secret black market demand could possibly contribute to elevated health risks. Yeah, I think the One Health model gives us a way of approaching our local communities that makes sense to them, and we're not dissociating human health from the rest of the world around them. So we can actually take it from the, a scientific concept, a community problem, work together, 
and through policy put it into action so that it actually does something. We think about pathogens that might be in the food or whether there's contaminants in the food, uh, understanding of who's at risk and, and developing preparedness approaches. The ability of communities to conduct their own biomonitoring programs where, where they're resident operated and the residents get the data and then they can use that to reduce the risk. So you don't have to stop eating the traditional diet, but there might be certain traditional foods that you want to change the way you eat them. One Health recognizes humans as essential members of a global ecosystem, not masters who control our environments. You know, from a Western point of view, we often try to maximize yields, get as much as we can. We need to start thinking in a more sustainable way as we approach these issues. You know, in indigenous worldview, they would look at decisions they make and things that they do as how it would affect seven generations in the future. Indigenous people have been using the concept of One Health for thousands of years. So they have always looked at the environment as a whole. We have taken care of our environment for over 10,000 years. My grandfather would often say, you know, when we take care of the land and we take care of the animals, they take care of us. I think that as Westerners, we need to look at the world that way too, because whether we want to admit it or not, we're still part of an ecosystem, whether you live in rural Alaska or downtown Anchorage or Manhattan. The environment that you live in influences your health and you influence the health of your environment. We are living on a planet with finite resources and therefore need for us to understand a healthy and sustainable relationship between humanity and the natural environment, which includes the land and the animals that provide for our sustenance as human beings. As the climate shifts globally, significant focus has turned to the Arctic, which is experiencing the most rapid effects of environmental change. As more and more species fight for their survival in the midst of their rapidly changing world. The University of Alaska Fairbanks, or UAF, is America's leading climate change and Arctic research institution, working collaboratively across the university system and with external partners throughout the globe. As the science around climate change has evolved, the university has established the Center for One Health Research, leading the way in the multidisciplinary approach for the circumpolar north. The University of Alaska, the Fairbanks campus in particular, really is, it's galvanizing this, this new emphasis on health issues. This is more or less ground zero for changes that are happening in the environment. Changes that are happening around the world are happening faster here. And so I think UAF is the perfect university really to start this One Health initiative. Throughout Alaska, UAF's research teams are harnessing new technologies, developing innovative approaches, and fostering partnerships through a One Health model in groundbreaking new ways. There's some pretty neat big projects going on in the state right now using new technology to understand our physical and biological world. We are one of the world leaders in unmanned aircraft and how that can be used for things like sea ice, for wildfire detection, for following migrations of animals, including whales. Large whales in Alaska basically serve as a canary in the coal mine. The whales are a sentinel species for us. They're big, they live a long time, and they travel over a huge part of the ocean. They eat a lot of food every day. They're feeding lower on the trophic scale. In the past, usually what we've had to do is either wait for a whale to die, and then you know we're not getting a random sample, we're getting a sample of a whale that died, or you go up and you, you shoot a small dart into the whale and it takes a, a small piece of their skin and blubber and we analyze that. But even that doesn't give us as good a, a picture of the whole whale. We started this adventure using a 21-foot carbon fiber pole from a little skiff and we'd chase whales around with a permit and it was really hard and we didn't get great samples and I oftentimes got more blow in my face than I did onto the actual petri dish. And so we were thinking about ways to do this better. The BLAST program, which is the Biomedical Learning and Student Training program, has funded us to um, purchase some drones. These unmanned aircraft then we have modified such that they can carry things like a petri dish. And when the whale comes up to spout, they have a drone that will swoop down and actually gather some of the material that comes out of that spout. And these petri dishes then we can bring back to the lab. So you don't have to get as close to a whale. They don't necessarily know that you're there. So you're collecting all this data very rapidly and very quickly. And it's very exciting as a marine mammal researcher because we generally operate with sample sizes in the tens to maybe fifties if we're lucky. And now we're, we're getting into the thousands. So we're getting into that big data realm. It's very important to monitor the health of these whales because they're consistently being eaten by 
Arctic indigenous communities. To that extent, a lot of our work helps to focus on the food security of um, subsistence hunting. Continuing research on the health of marine mammals is very important because in turn, we're also monitoring the health of indigenous people. Through a One Health approach, health is defined as not merely the absence of disease, but rather encompasses mental, behavioral, emotional, cultural, and spiritual health and well-being for communities and individuals. We hear a lot about how changes in the environment and changes in food security are having an impact on communities and their mental health and wellness. One of the biggest issues facing young people in rural Alaska is the prevalence of substance abuse, violence, and suicide. In one community, I think I dealt with 10 suicides once every week for 10, 10 weeks. It affects the whole community, the whole village. It affects the next village, and a lot of times it never heals. For multiple communities, the solution came not through new innovations, but rather in returning to traditional knowledge and lifestyles so central to indigenous people's history. Oftentimes we look at something like suicide and we think that from a standard mainstream Western perspective that that individual has a problem. But what we've come to understand is that there's actually a, a family, a community, a society, and a framework surrounding that person that may lead to a higher likelihood of suicidal ideation. And so it's not an individual problem, it's a social problem, it's a community challenge. Addressing the sense of isolation and connecting young people to their heritage allows them to discover a life worth living outside themselves. They're building the cultural skills that help them to feel a sense of pride in, in their identity and who they are. But we're also providing opportunities for them to get to learn from other tribal elders that are there to support them. Mike Williams of Akiak, who lost six brothers to suicide and alcohol-related deaths, found peace and hope through his connection with another species, sled dogs. I mushed for 75,000 miles. Those dogs uh, really saved my life. Over the years, Mike has participated in some of the most well-known races in Alaska while advocating sobriety and a healthy lifestyle. In each race, he'd carry pledges from fans that lived along the trail. The pledge that they would be sober for uh, maybe a weekend or a month or a year. He took hundreds of thousands of signatures with him, which was a lot of extra weight in his sled, just to make people aware of the fact that this is a problem and, and it's something needs to be done about it. People would come to him and say, I haven't had a drink since last year and it's because of you. Many community leaders throughout interior Alaska begin advocating the use of dog sledding to connect young people with their heritage. Our languages and our cultures and our way of life are coming back to reconnect. So those dogs get everybody together to bridge that gap. There's nothing else that could teach you about responsibility more than a bunch of living beings in your, in your yard. It's your job to make sure they're fed and watered and taken care of. You know, a snow machine, I can park a snow machine in May and not touch it till September. And it's not the case with the dog team. It's 365 days a year. And so there's just a special bond and connection. If you're thinking about harming yourself or doing something and, and you have that animal depending on you, all of a sudden you're thinking about more than just yourself. You're thinking about other things that, that matter. They have a sense of accomplishment to take care of uh, those animals. The dogs are a great healer. They're helping young people through a difficult time in their life. Maybe you feel like a lot of people don't understand what you're going through or what's going on in your life. Dogs understand, and they're always happy to see you. It really has to be holistic and comprehensive. The connection to elders and young people within the community are all significant factors affecting the health and well-being of an individual. I think scientists haven't until recently valued what traditional knowledge can bring in. And keep in mind that traditional knowledge has over 10,000 years of proven efficacy. <laughs> to say that, that one is absolute over the other, I think, is missing opportunities to bring both types of that knowledge together. And that is one thing that is actually one of the essences of One Health. Through this One Health approach, communities are real partners with scientists in all stages of research. Nowhere has this collaboration been more important than in the communities of Alaska most affected by climate change. I study sea ice, but when you come up to a community like Okriagvik, you can't talk about sea ice without talking about whaling. It's not feasible, it's not natural to try and separate that from the, the human health and the, the, the society. We're trying to connect with the people who are affected by the changes so that we can determine just what the impacts are, economic impacts, social impacts, human impacts. It's really changing and there's multiple captains that are losing their ice cellar due to, you know, 
know, warming climates and longer summers, it's really devastating to be losing that. So I think there's this tremendous scientific benefit that comes from working with local experts. I've always thought that I've learned as much about sea ice just going out on the ice with elders and hunters who spent their lives on the ice and whose lives have depended on understanding the sea ice. It was good to have the local knowledge perspective and then also the scientific perspective. About six years ago, you know, we had a real strong east winds and ice broke off on the shore pass and took a whaling crew with them. First thing we did was we got a hold of, you know, Andy and the rest of the guys out there because they have the ice radar here in town to see which way it went. And he calls me and says, hey, the ice is breaking away. What's your radar showing? I pulled up our data and saw that, yes, it was breaking away and, and we could calculate how fast it was moving and in what direction. You know, we were successful in um, retrieving that whaling crew just due to the fact that fast actions of you know, the scientific side of things. The shared knowledge between stakeholders and researchers has created collaborative partnerships for, for observing the changing environmental conditions that affect day-to-day -day life. Those people are, are sharing their observations with the Knowledge Hub, and then the Knowledge Hub is broadcasting that information. So, of course, you get this unrivaled observational record. These people are very skilled at telling you what's unusual. Kind of the eyes and ears on the ground that give us information that no remotely operated instrument or satellite could ever give us. None of these uh, research and uh, programs to improve health, none of them will work without the complete involvement of community members. Hunters, mothers, elders, tribal council, they all have to be involved and think it's a good idea or it simply doesn't fly. If you really want to make the most of working with indigenous people, understanding their value system is really important because there's time spent building trust on both sides and that's very valuable. As the 2020 COVID-19 outbreak taught us, regional issues can quickly have global implications, which is why the environmental changes in the Arctic are so important and why utilizing a holistic One Health approach is absolutely vital. The One Health initiative is really fabulous. Alaska is everything Arctic to America. We really are on the cutting edge. We live and breathe Arctic issues. Uh, climate change is affecting the Arctic at a faster rate than anywhere else on the planet, and we're here to witness it. Uh, we're here to study it. What's happening here is gonna happen other places. We're just seeing it earlier and, and to a more dramatic degree. So the, the question that emerges is, what can be done as we, we anticipate the changes that are coming along in the environment that are in turn going to affect the the ecosystems and, and people. And that's an important aspect of One Health is that it provides us with a very helpful framework, not just how do we adapt, but how do we mitigate, how do we respond. And the fact that we're seeing so much larger changes here than in many other parts of the globe puts us in a position where on the one hand we're challenged, but on the other hand, we have an opportunity by bringing together experts here at the university, bringing together indigenous knowledge holders and experts out in, in rural Alaska, bringing together the best that technology and industry, the private sector, have to offer to, to help us think through how do we best respond. And I think that is a question of global concern and it's going to require humanity to be coming closer together. And really, the approach we're taking here, we call it interdisciplinary, but it's also intercultural and bringing together different worldviews and perspectives and understanding and knowledge systems to help contribute to this conversation of how do we come together in a way that's going to produce positive and sustainable outcomes for the health and well-being within humanity. Mm -hmm.